Today's episode is especially meaningful, and if you're out there suffering from stress and anxiety as a result of this 2020 election, trust me, you aren't alone. In fact, the American Psychological Association estimates that up to 70% of Americans are suffering from significant stress during perhaps one of the most adversarial elections in the history of the United States. With constant media attention and bickering, it's no surprise that many of us are feeling stressed and anxiety. So stay tuned for today's episode on mental health and strategies on coping during this time. Take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and this is The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Mental health includes all of our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, we feel, and we act. It also determines how we handle stress and how we relate to each other and make choices. The World Health Organization Constitution states that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely just an absence of disease. You know, mental health is something we talk a lot about at the Wall Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. And my guest today is a clinical psychologist specializing in stress, anger management, and pain medicine. He is a clinical assistant professor of psychology and medicine and the psychologist for the Wall Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care. Please welcome Dr. Robert Allen. So Dr. Allen, it's great to have you join us here today on The Backstory. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. You know, I first want to talk a little bit about stress. And you know, stress isn't always a bad thing. You know, we, we always consider and associate stress with something negative. But in performance and in athletes and even in a stressful procedure, sometimes it can make you focus and make you deliver a better product. But no question about it, there is some negativity or negative impact on your body when it comes to stress. So tell us, tell us a little bit about stress and the impact that you see it having on our physical and mental health. Well, we all need a certain amount of stress in order to function and feel good. Uh, just doing this radio interview with you is somewhat stressful, just a little bit. It gets me alert, focused, thinking, feeling, sensing, uh, all good things. The problem is when there's too much stress, then we, we become overwhelmed and we make choices that are not so great. How do you feel yourself getting from like a good stress to this overwhelming stress level? Well, well generally we don't until after afterwards, it's until it's too late. You know, you get home and you just feel washed out or I, I struggle with this myself as you've acknowledged that you do too. You know, sometimes after a really busy week, I wake up Saturday morning feeling like I was hit by a bus. I'm sure that I had too much to deal with on those Saturday mornings. Uh, I try to work hard to, to leave some spaces in between activities. It's not always successful. I think I do a fairly good job. You kind of nailed it on the head. Stress manifests in some type of physical ailments as well. So even if we're taking mental stress on or the burden of work or childcare or whatever, you said it yourself, you felt like you got hit by a bus. So how does that manifestation of this presumably hormonal stress relate to physical adaptation and stress on our body? Well, the, the basic stress mechanism is also termed the fight or flight response. And it occurs whenever we perceive danger. And it goes back to ancient times. Actually, all mammals have a fight, flight, or freeze response. And so just think back 5,000 years ago for our ancestors wandering the plains in Africa or wherever it was. And in the distance, they see a lion or a tiger or an opposing warrior. What happens? All of a sudden, their heart starts to race. Their adrenaline increases to power their large muscles. They stop digesting lunch because who needs to digest lunch if you're about to become lunch? Yeah, right. So all of these physiologic mechanisms are very helpful to adapt if there's true danger. However, why are you looking at me that way? You're going to give me a bad review, I could tell. <laughs> You know, of course, I'm just joking with you right now, but if I thought that you were a menace to me in some way, I'd have that same physiologic response. And for some of us who go through the day chronically 
driven with the perception of danger, uh, the physiologic responses, the physiologic consequences are not good, particularly in cardiology, because we know that there's a strong relationship between stress and various kinds of heart disease, in particular, coronary artery disease, uh, the disease that leads to heart attacks and bypass surgery and sudden death, and also Takotsubo uh, cardiomyopathy. But that's really not our competence. No, but that's interesting topic. you say that. So in patients who maybe have a history of coronary artery disease, or maybe even have high cholesterol, do you think they can take some control of the outcome by managing their stress better rather than ending up with a bypass surgery or other cardiac surgery? Yeah, there is considerable data that shows that if you learn how to manage your stress, your cardiac outcome is better. And for what we deal with in you know, the Walk Cornell Center for Conference of Spine Care, pain on its own can probably be a stressor. And stress can cause pain, and we enter this vicious cycle of stress and pain, stress and pain. How do you kind of uh, attack that when you talk to patients dealing with these things? Well, first I attacked it by becoming a patient of uh, the Spine Center myself about 10 years ago when I had uh, some L4, L5 herniated discs that looked really terrible on uh, MRI. And um, I've been a successful patient here, treated well. I had one epidural and some physical therapy, and, and I now jog and horseback ride every weekend. So uh, it's a testimony to the, the center here. You know, we talk about, and, and I struggle with this as well, we have patients at the center who have disc herniations like yourself, who may have had physical therapy, maybe an injection, maybe even surgery. And from a structural standpoint, we think we've done a very good job. We've treated the pain. And in our multidisciplinary spine conferences, I love that you always ask the question that a lot of us forget to ask is, how is this patient coping with their pain? How, what's their mental status? How are they dealing with it? And I love that you asked that, and I love that you make us recognize that we don't ask it. So in those patients, when you know, we refer patients to you for treatment in a multidisciplinary fashion, how do you approach those questions and approach those topics with the patient? Well, the pa pain is, is necessary. We all have to deal with a certain amount of pain. What we tell ourselves about it is really the issue. So if we're lying in bed thinking, I'm never going to get better. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life. My life is ruined. My wife is going to leave me. My children hate me. The dog won't even come to sit next to me, you just make it so much worse. And both depression and anger increase pain sensitivity, that is the perception of pain. So if you're depressed, you just kind of like lie around feeling sorry for yourself. I like doing that once in a while, maybe you do too, Dr. Singh. Sure. You know, a little, a little occasional pity party. <laughs> uh, but if it becomes chronic, it's really not very good. And when we express anger in an angry way, that makes pain much worse. You touched on a topic that I definitely want to get into, which is pain and suffering. Pain, we all can experience pain, whether it's cardiac, like you mentioned, you know, heart attack, whether it's degenerative joint conditions. So there is a biological physical and psychological component of pain. But when it comes to suffering, now we're talking about how you respond to that pain, the emotional impact. Tell me a little bit or talk a little bit about pain versus suffering. How can we manage that in ourselves and, and discuss it with our patients? Pain is physiological or physical. Suffering has to do with thoughts, what we tell ourselves about the pain. So as I was saying a moment ago, if I tell myself this is never going to get better, uh, it's going to make me feel really terrible. It's going to ruin my life. If I say to myself, on the other hand, you know, I think that my prognosis is pretty good here. That's what the doctors tell me. And I'm going to be dealing with this. No fun. I'm feeling the pain in my back right now. It really is not good. I don't like it. But I can see the sun coming up in the horizon. And I'm going to be feeling better sometime soon. And I'm going to try to focus on that. And most importantly focused on what I can do. Because from a psychological point of view, the best treatment for pain is distraction. If you're focused on something else, if you're reading a book, watching a movie, talking to your wife or your children in a nice way, you're not so much focused on your pain. This is something that comes up all the time in the patients that we see. One of the big questions, especially in patients with neuropathy or radiculopathy, which is kind of like sciatica, patients always say, my pain is worse at nighttime. Why is my pain worse at night? And I kind of talk about what you just mentioned. You know, when you're up and about, all of your senses are working, you're looking, you're seeing, tasting, touching things. At nighttime, our brain is only focused on one thing, which is where that pain is coming from. So we don't have that distraction. 
So I appreciate you saying that because this is kind of what we talk about with our patients. One of the big challenges that I have in clinic is bringing up this psychological component of pain perception. I'm getting better at it. Certainly before I met you, I rarely would talk about it. And now I try to bring it up with almost every patient encounter. And my fear is I don't want the patient to think I'm saying to them, get over it. The pain is in your head, which is not what I'm saying. I'm saying you have pain. I understand that there is maybe something structural, but there's also that psychological component of it. So speak to me a little bit about A, what's the best way to bring that up with a patient without them feeling like this is in their head? And then when I do refer the patients to you, what are some of the strategies that you employ with them to kind of help with that portion of pain perception? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's most important to emphasize to the patient that you think that their pain is real, that it's not in their head, they're not imagining it. But how they deal with that pain, what their emotional reactions are to the pain, what their thoughts are in particular, are very important. And much of our thinking is automatic. We're not aware of our thoughts as they go by. It, there was an article in the Times recently that said that at least 40 or 50% of our thoughts are just like daydreaming. But if you have a daydream that your wife is out with another man, or if you have a daydream that um, you're going to get fired, and you don't really realize that in the moment, you'll discover that you're not feeling so good a little bit later. But if you catch it in the moment, if you're mindful of your thoughts, then you can realize that they determine very much how you're feeling. So here's a good example. You come home from work, you open the mailbox, and there's an envelope from the IRS. You realize you took a couple of uh, liberties with your income tax last year. How do you feel when you look at that envelope? You look at it, you pick it up, and you're kind of like, hmm. And you open it up, and there's a tax refund. <laughs> so you can see by that example, here's, a, here's another one that all parents of adult children have gone through. You know, your kid gets his, his or her license, takes the car out, it's supposed to be home at 10 o'clock, they swore that they'd be home at 10 o'clock, it's midnight, where are they, what happened, did they have an accident, were they out doing drugs, what was going on here? So how do you feel in that circumstance? I've, I've been there myself, you know, just where is my daughter, I'm feeling so nervous. And, but we, we do the same thing with pain, but mindfulness is about being in the moment and being aware of what we're thinking. I joke with you before, you're gonna give me a bad review. If I had that thought automatically, and it didn't register that I was having that thought, but it just kind of like went by. And I had seven or eight or nine or 10 or 20 other similar thoughts about bad things that were gonna to happen to me. How is it gonna make me feel? So becoming aware of our thoughts, being mindful of our thoughts can be extraordinarily helpful in terms of managing not just pain, but managing life. You bring up a really good example. I remember when I was growing up, my sister and I were at a Kinko's making photocopies for some science project. This was before cell phones. And we said the same thing to my mother. We'd be home at 9 o'clock or whatever. And 9 turned into 9.30, turned into 10. At the same time, on TV, at 60 Minutes, was the topic, where are your children now? So when we came home, she was furious with us. And yeah, the story that she had made up in her mind that something bad happened to us because there's no way for us to contact her. And you're absolutely right. If we dwell on that story and dwell on this perception of something negative, instead of attacking it right away, yeah, your emotions are going to go down, you're going to get a little depressed and a little down. But that brings me to my question then, mindfulness. You know, we throw out mindfulness, being self-aware. You know, in America, we spend so much time on our physical hygiene. You know, I brush my teeth, I comb my hair, I put a turban on, I choose the clothes I wear. But when it comes to mental hygiene, I think we kind of neglect it. And I do the same thing. I'm busy at work. Then I go home and I try to spend time with the kids and my wife. And if I have these feelings of negativity, I kind of push them down because I don't have time for mental hygiene. And that's probably not healthy. So I guess my question is, how do we practice self-awareness? How do we practice mindfulness and becoming more aware of what we're feeling inside rather than pushing it down and then maybe suffering the consequences later on? There's no free lunch, Ricky. You know? Uh, we all have to make efforts to manage our stress if we want to improve it. One thing you can do is take two minutes here, three minutes there, uh, five minutes here. Maybe if you 
really want to luxuriate, spend 15 minutes meditating once or twice a day. I've heard dramatic improvements from patients who've been able to set aside significant times a day to, uh, to meditate. Most recently, a patient of one of our colleagues who has these impossibly painful headaches, you know, that that have gotten much better as he's done some meditation. You have to pay, there's no free lunch. We're gonna do an exercise for the listeners and for myself a little bit later on something that we can teach ourselves to do and practice. So if you're listening right now, please stay tuned for that at the end of this episode. One of the treatments that we talk about in dealing with pain and suffering is something called cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. That was a foreign concept to me coming out of residency. Of course, we touched on it in in medical school training, but I never really experienced what that is like. So can you talk to us about what is CBT? How do you employ it with your patients? And what are some of the outcomes that you've seen? We've actually been talking about it in the context of mindfulness. It has to do with cognitions, what we're thinking, and behavior. And as we've been saying, what we think are cognitions determine in large part how we feel and then oftentimes determine how we behave. So I say to myself, this is never going to get better. The only thing I can do is lie in bed. And then I lie in bed and I feel sorry for myself and I feel worse and worse and worse and depressed. So those thoughts determine how we feel. That is a major advance in psychotherapy in this past century. You know, in Freudian theory, we used to think that feelings determine thoughts. Well, Aaron Beck turned that on his head, and he said, no, no, you got that backwards. It's what we think determines how we feel. So if I think you're going to give me an envelope with $1,000 at the end of this podcast, it brought a smile to your face as to mine as well. But if I thought that you're going to take $1,000 from me, I'd be really unhappy. No, I would love to give you $1,000. That's (laughs) that's not a problem at all. (laughs) Where does then pharmacotherapy come into changing how you feel. In Indian culture, I'll be the first to admit, we don't talk about mental health a lot. You know, depression, anxiety, and stress are all made up in your mind, and you should be mentally tough to overcome those things with meditation or prayer or all those things. So we really minimize the biology of mental health, which is That's not just Indian culture, you know, and it's a big slice of um, American culture as well. I would say mostly for the uneducated, because some depression is indeed biological. Now, some of it we can work on with cognitive behavioral therapy, but there, there are certain kinds of depression, like major depressive disorder, which in large part are physiologic. And even in moderate depression, uh, medication can often be helpful to give you a kind of head start so that you can practice CBT and mindfulness. So medication antidepressants are often very, very helpful. Presumably treating depression with the medication is similar to treating heart disease with an anti-cholesterol pill. But if you don't change how you eat, you're not going to really get the benefits of the medication. And similarly, in mental health, if you don't employ CBT or mindfulness, you could take all the antidepressants you want, and presumably you won't get a good outcome. Well, not necessarily. You know, I've I've seen people get better without psychotherapy who take antidepressants. Psychotherapy is not for everybody, and I have a great deal of difficulty with broccoli and cauliflower. My wife eats broccoli as a snack. (laughs) No, that's, that's not for me either. I would love to be <laughs> hypnotized or anything into eating more broccoli. Let's talk about a patient encounter, a patient example. You know, someone from our Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care comes to you after undergoing many treatments with the injections and medications, maybe physical therapy and surgery, still having these negative thoughts about their outcome. And we look at the imaging, we talk about them at our multidisciplinary center and saying, in our toolbox, I have no more interventions to offer. Maybe there is a perception of pain component. So talk to us a little bit about how that patient encounter goes and then what strategies you discuss with the patient. So again, it's about what you can do. Granted, I've, I've seen quite a number of those patients. Those are usually the ones that wind up sending me. <laughs> I apologize. For that. <laughs> it's about radical acceptance. You know, this is, this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. And actually, you know, as we all get older, We all have to deal with radical acceptance. You know, I'm a jogger and I run much slower than I used to. So I've had to accept that. Um, When it comes to pain, it's of course much more severe, but um, 
patients have to realize that there's no magic bullet for uh, severe pain. And yeah, they may have to live with it, but what can I do? Yeah, a lot of, I go through life hurting a lot, but what can I do? Uh, I can't stand for very long. Maybe you have a cure for me for that. But I can uh, ride horses. I can uh, canter and post and um, jump fences, little fences. Uh, but standing? Hmm, I can't stand for a long time. So it sounds like when, when you speak with a patient, you focus on the glass half full concepts. Things that you e- even, even if the glass is three quarters empty, I talk about a quarter of your tank is full. What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to go? I love that analogy. I think... You're right. I mean, we are so blessed in so many different ways and negative things do happen in our lives. We have a choice there, just like you mentioned. We can focus on those negative things, the three quarters of the glass, or maybe be more optimistic and figure out a strategy in coming out of this, especially in spine pain and things that we see within the clinic. I mean, the value add of cognitive behavioral therapy and being mindful is is tremendous. What are some things you could tell the listeners, and if you want, we could do the exercise now on taking a few minutes out of your day, not pushing down these emotions and being more mindful and and present. So the easiest thing to do is abdominal breathing. So just put your hand on your stomach for 30 seconds and just be aware of your breath at the tip of your nose, your chest, and your stomach and watch your thoughts as they go by. Most of them hardly matter. They're like the clouds in the sky. Oops, I left the stove on. If you have that thought, you gotta get up and turn it off. You see, mind thinks. It thinks in us. And things that we have not quite completed often come to mind when we sit still for a second. So I realize, oh, I didn't pay the rent, I didn't pay the phone bill or whatever. So if it's an important thought, take note of it. And after you're doing the meditation, take care of it. If it's the stove is on and you're going to burn the house down, then stop the meditation immediately and get up and take care of it. I abbreviated that a little bit, but it's just to be aware of your breath at the tip of your nose, your chest, and most importantly, your abdomen. And in contrast to the fight or flight response, that's called the relaxation response. You're right, it's, it's practice. Because even while I'm trying to be mindful and self-present and here with you, the moment we stop talking and we focus on breathing, my mind immediately goes to many, many different things. What paper do I have to write? My patients are coming in at 12 o'clock and it takes practice to get those things out of your mind just to focus on nothing. It thinks in us. So we, we catch ourselves thinking and then we can say to ourselves thinking and then refocus the attention back primarily on the abdomen because we want to do abdominal breathing. That's when we're most relaxed. If you watch a baby breathing, you can see its stomach rise and fall with each breath. When we're anxious, having a panic attack, it's you know, shallow, short breathing. So that process that you're talking about is normal and natural. I sit here for a couple of minutes, and I'm thinking that I have to finish working on this paper. I have a patient downstairs to see, blah, 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 blah. You just let those thoughts go by and kind of disregard them. And when you catch yourself overwhelmed with thoughts, you just discovered you had 12, 15 thoughts, you say to yourself, thinking, and come back to the awareness of your breath. And you you capture moments of more pure awareness like that. And if you do that for 15 minutes, I can practically guarantee you're going to feel better. I love what you're saying about these small little strategies on being self-aware. We could all use that in our lives and our day-to-day work, especially in New York City with COVID and all this stuff going around. I think just taking a break from these stresses in our lives could be very, very beneficial to our physical health, just like we talked about. I do want to talk about one more topic, which is uh, something you do specialize in, anger management. And I I see this a lot in the clinic when patients come in, despite our interventions, they're in pain. This 
makes them angry. This might make them angry at me because I haven't delivered on my promise of helping them with their pain. What is anger management and how, how, do, you, how do you deal with this in your patients? Well, we're all blessed with a certain degree of anger. When we see something that's unjust, unfair, deal with somebody who's incompetent, we see them as being incompetent, we get angry. I do too. You know, the question is, how do we manage that anger? I could look at you and call you all sorts of names and you're going to say, thank you very much. I appreciate you telling me I'm an idiot. Or we could realize that we're angry and say to ourselves, what's the most effective way to respond to this perceived injustice? And if you curse when you're angry, I suggest you replace your four-letter Anglo-Saxon expletive with one of these words. What do I need? What do I want? And what's my goal? And then negotiate to fill that need, want, or goal. And do it as quietly as you can. And best is to wait. Uh, my all-time favorite quote about anger comes from the French philosopher S.S. Montaigne, who in 1564, I think, said, there's no passion that so shakes the clarity of our judgment as anger. Things truly seem different to us once we've quieted and cooled down. So something that made you angry yesterday, it will elicit anger today, but at a much lower level than it did yesterday. And something that happened a year ago, unless it was tragic and traumatic, it will hardly get a rise in you. So we need to process the anger, let it pass, and then think to yourself, what do I need? What do I want? And what's my goal? And then ask your wife if she will Stop making noise when you're practicing the piano. <laughs> you know, you've articulated so beautifully, maybe something that I have been practicing for the past 20 years. You know, I remember after 9-11 when people would say certain pseudo-racist things to me and I would respond immediately with anger and physical altercations. And at some point, I realized this is not the best strategy because I'm not changing behaviors, I'm not changing attitudes. And, you know, it hasn't happened recently, but maybe five, six years ago, I was with my family and someone may have said something and I didn't respond at all. But my wife got very angry at that person for saying something to me. In my head, I'm like, what's the, what's the point? What are we trying to accomplish here by attacking that person? What was my goal, just like you mentioned? And my goal was to educate, not necessarily to respond with anger because that's not going to accomplish what I want, what I need, and what, what my goals are. So I love how you articulated what I was feeling all along. And that's a great strategy. This can be used in any circumstance, in raising your kids, in domestic relationships, rather than the spark flaming, take a step back and say, what are we trying to accomplish here? Yeah, I just want to emphasize that this is not easy. You know, the, the uh, fight or flight response, the fight aspect is anger. You know, you perceive injustice and you want to punch the other person's lights out. So that impulse takes some time to quiet because the saber-toothed tiger that you saw or that warrior that you saw that elicited the fight or flight response might still be in the neighborhood. So it takes a while for the fight or flight to calm down. And it takes a while for the rational thoughts to supersede the emotional reaction, which is why Descartes' uh, expression is so, so fantastic. You shared a lot with us and, and me, especially on the concept of mindfulness and being self-aware, being present. The breathing exercise you shared with us today, I'm going to use that probably 10 times today, just in between patients and trying to take a step back from what's going on in my day-to-day -day life. I want to leave us with uh, something that Dr. Siegel from UCLA says in relation to mindfulness, which is a concept and approach called COAL, C-O-A-L. And it stands for curiosity, openness, acceptance, and love. And these are ways where we can become more curious about what's around us instead of being closed off and making up that story of me giving you a bad review. Coming in with openness thinking there's more than one approach to a problem, especially when it comes to pain management. Accepting yourself and those around you with self-love, loving those around yourselves, and then, of course, love. This, this approach really hits home with me because I think it's something we can employ in our lives, especially when dealing with patients, dealing with issues at home with the family and things like that. Before we go, anything else we can share with the listeners? Anything that you would like us to know about mental health and mindfulness and things of, of mm. that nature. Yeah, you mentioned curiosity. I'd like to focus on that for a second with a little example here. A couple of years ago, I was coming to the hospital. I was in a taxi, and it was a bad snowstorm. And I had this really hot-headed taxi driver. 
And he, he had his hand on the horn and was just so enraged that the car, that was a truck in front of him, had stopped and he couldn't make the light. And out of the truck comes this big, burly guy and walks up to the window. And the cab driver is like, you know, oh, oh, what's going to go on here? Guy says, roll down your window. So he rolls down the window and he says to him, there was somebody in a wheelchair in front of my truck. Did you want me to run them over? That's great. I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, we see people having bad days and they respond in a certain way. And we don't know what's going on in anyone else's life at that time. And there's being open, being open to that opportunity and to, to learn, each other. right? Be learn. curious. You know, why, why, did, why did this happen? Well, Dr. Allen, I loved sharing this time with you. I really appreciate everything you do with us at the Wild Cornell Center for Comprehensive Spine Care and sharing with patients and helping them overcome a lot of the deficiencies that we have in our care, you know, I, I have so many, I have a limit of what I can offer. And without you, I don't think we'd be getting as good as outcomes as we do. So I, I really appreciate you getting you involved with the, our patients at the Spine Center. Being mindful, being self-aware, being curious, all important concepts to living a mentally healthier life, trying not to neglect that in lieu of our physical and outward appearance, working on the inside as well. Dr. Allen, I appreciate your time. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you so much. It's been a delight, Dr. Singh. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y. S-I-N-G-H-M-D dot com.